Much How better. You How are you, Sly? Oh, I'm feeling great. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great as well. It's um, about to go out on the road and do some shows, so I'm wow. excited. Yeah, I got I wore my Neil Diamond for you today. I love it. I love it. And I love some Neil Diamond. Yeah, he rocks. He rocks. That is unbelievable. Welcome to the Bits of Margarita Show. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks to, uh, shout out to producer Rhea Roma. Rhea yeah, Roma. For setting that uh, up. What an unbelievable. I mean, I mean, she has brought so much energy and I mean, just told me so much wonderful things. You guys have been best friends for many, many years. Yeah, it's true. And that's it's true. We go back to uh, the Pointer Sisters. We we actually met through the Pointer Sisters, who I'm really good friends with, and as wow. is as is Rhea, and that's how we became friends many years ago in the '80s. Wow, man. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that something? This yeah, is the, I love her. This is the Black Diamond. First African American Neil Diamond tribute singer, man. Yes, is that crazy? The only to this the day, only. still the only Black African American Neil Diamond tribute. Yeah, that is so cool, man. Yeah, it's really crazy. I actually, I just before, while we were uh, setting up this Zoom, I got a text message from Neil Diamond's longtime percussionist. Uh, he lives in Las Vegas, a guy named King Eris. His name is Arison Johnson. But Neil called him the king of the congas because he was like, you know, the best conga player. Wow. He played for uh, Lou Raw and he played for Barry White and wow. uh, ultimately he played for Neil Diamond. He just sent me a text uh, oh, telling me man. I think he has some shirts for me. <laughs> hey! I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Why yeah. not? Why not? So you your singing career started out in 2000? Uh yes, it'll be in this in September it'll be 23, it'll be the 23rd anniversary of the Black Diamond experience. Unbelievable. Charleston, yeah. West Virginia. Started in Charleston, West Virginia and it started because I uh, uh got fired from my job at the Marriott Hotel, where I worked at the front desk, and I sang to all the guests. <laughs> and they, they told me I had to stop singing, and I, I said, well, sure. I, I knew a guest would complain sooner or later. They said, no, no, no. The guests love it, but your coworkers don't. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, that makes no sense. And anyway, I left and, and, um, and just started hustling up gigs, really, around Charleston, West Virginia, which I did for three years until Jimmy Kimmel found me and brought me out to Hollywood. Oh, man, that's show. something. So, yeah. I mean, so the, the fan following just accumulated. You got Correct. this buzz, buzz in the city. All of a yes. sudden, here comes Jimmy Kimmel. Correct. And, and out says, of the hey, I want you to be on the show. You were on yes. Jimmy Kimmel Live. Yes. I mean, how, did, how did you feel, man? That moment was so surreal, Sly. It was like, it was just, I was in a, a zone. It was so unreal to me because I just really thought when I started singing Neil Diamond's songs that I would just do it until really I landed another job at another hotel. And right. so that was my plan. And But then one year went by and two years went by and three years. And then Jimmy Kimmel came along and and I thought, this is not happening. This can't be happening. And he brought me on the show and I was on there with Macy Gray. Wow. Macy yeah. Gray. The nicest person. She was so nice and so supportive of what I was doing and really encouraging of it. I think she gave me her phone number after the show. Oh, you know, man. Have you ever have any questions? Yeah. So how was the transition? So now West Virginia, now you're in Hollywood. I mean, yeah. that must have been, you know, I mean, what a transition that, that's got to be for you. It was a transition because, so after the show, also I should say, Jimmy Kimmel uh, took me bowling <laughs> in Hollywood. What? So he was like, you want to go bowling? And I was like, yes, I do. We went bowling and uh, that's when he was talking to me and, and he said, this is, 
your everything's going to change tomorrow. And uh, and it did. Boy, it was fast. It was really oh, fast. Was. It was a transition. Yeah. As you said a minute ago, it, it really was. And I was just kind of like, uh, you know, I it was I just had to brace myself. And you of course, believe. I talked to you couldn't believe what was happening. I talked to the Pointer sisters and uh, they they told me, just ride it. Just go with it. Just ride it and uh, ride enjoy the it. Ride the wave. Ride the wave. Yes. And then ultimately they would the Pointer Sisters, God bless them, would take me out on the road to open for them. Wow. And speaking mm -hmm. of opening for them, the village people, Brad Paisley. Yes. I mean, spinners, boys yes. in. Yes, the boys to me. Yeah, the platters. That was a that was a great one because my mom loves, you know, my mom loves the I love the platters. My mom's a super fan. And uh, to get to open for them and to kind of meet them and hang out with them. Uh, was great. The spinners. My, I grew up on the spinners. Oh God! And so when I did that show, it was really funny because the spinners were in like their dressing room, but they heard me doing the sound check, and they. I looked over. And there they were. They had come out of their dressing room and they were just standing there, just like. <laughs> This guy really sounds like Neil Diamond. And I just thought, I told him, I said, you know, we I grew up on the you the spinners. Wow. I mean, you're part of the impact of my on my singing. So yeah, it's it's and Brad Paisley, uh, the village people, of course, the village people. Oh, let me the tell you about village the village people. people. Yeah. One of them one of them tried to get my shirt. I was in my sequin <laughs> shirt. And the Indian Jose Philippe walked up to me. He goes, I, "He goes, that's a great shirt." Because I want that shirt. <laughs> and I laughed and his joke. He goes, "No, no, no, I'm dead serious. I want the shirt." <laughs> wow, that's so great, close, man. Yeah. So I mean, you see must the East End Taylor said, Dane. You said what? Dana Dane. Album for Taylor Dane. Album for oh. Sheena Easton. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You must have had a real, you know, like eclectic mix of artists influence you throughout. Yeah, really. So grow it really was. Uh, so I grew up on um uh you know the spinners, the Jackson Five, Gladys Knight and the Pips, Gladys Knight and the Pips, oh my gosh. Uh Barry White, Isaac Hayes, Lou Rawls. And then as I got a little bit older into my teenage years and, and started hearing the Neil Diamond comparison, you know, they would hear me in church and say, you sound like Neil Diamond. And so that's when I kind of started learning who he was and expanding my musical horizons to uh, the Carpenters. I love the Carpenter. I love Karen Carpenter. Her voice is just hauntingly beautiful. Uh, and Barbara Streisand and the Bee Gees. And I started hearing other other people, but growing up, it was the Pointer Sisters, and I remember my older sister had a Pointer Sisters album, and the Temptations, and but yes, thankfully I did expand my uh, my musical horizons. Your musical horizons. Now, I mean, yeah. were you vocally trained, or this was this just all natural? So, I, I, you know, how I was trained. I, I had no vocal lessons. And people ask me that question frequently and they say, well, what would you recommend that I should do if I wanted to try to learn to sing or or nurture my uh, my voice? And I'd say uh, buy a Donna Summer album. <laughs> yes. Really? That's how I learned. I listened to Donna Summer's albums. Wow. Over That's and over so and over. So yes. It's huge. She was amazing. Yeah. And may she rest in rest in peace i would say that if it wasn't for donna summer i would not be a singer today wow that's interesting wow mm -hmm. yeah absolutely love her and she can teach you you listen to her records man and you're going to learn sly you're going to learn a lot of things you're going to learn to uh to breathe you're going to learn to anticipate a high note like if you're singing uh oh holy night you know, that high note at the end of the song. You're going to learn to not over sing the song. 
not under sing the song, display emotion and feeling, connect with the song that you're giving to the audience. Yeah. And I learned all of that from Donna Summer albums. Oh man, that's that's yeah. magnificent. Yeah. And so let's so let's go. So now here you go. You you're singing, you're a little singing canary in Hollywood. 2013, yeah. you got a biography written. The real illusion. First yes. I want what is the meaning of that name? The real illusion. Yeah, so it's called Black Diamond, The Real Illusion. And really what I, and I came up with the name and I remember when I, I dreamed of the name, I was asleep and the, and the name came to me in this dream. And when I woke up, I called Scott Nolan, the writer of the book. And I told him, I said, I think it should be called Black Diamond, The Real Illusion. Wow. And he, I remember he was a little hesitant about that. And he said, well, I'll have to talk to the publisher. And he goes, I said, I, I know, but you got to convince him because it's that's the book. And um, he and he goes, why? Why should it be called that? And I said, because I'm not really Neil Diamond. I hopefully create an illusion of him right. when people come to the show. That's and so I think. I dreamed of it, Scott. So that's what it should be called. And and thankfully, the publisher uh, went with it, went for it. And that's what they called the book. And, uh, you know, when he wrote that book in 2013, he it took him about two years to convince me to let him write the book. He, we met in Las Vegas and oh. he told me that he thought he said, did I just hear you in that interview say that you were homeless in Washington, D.C., and you sang on the street with a tip jar, and I said, you did, and he goes, and now you're in Vegas, and I said, yeah, he goes, that's a book, I'm going to write a book about you, and I, I just laughed, I didn't have any money, so I was backstage eating all the pizza they had back there, <laughs> and, he, and I looked at him like he was from Jupiter, and I said, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not a book, though, but thank you. And he said, no, it's a book. I said, it might be a newspaper article, but it's not a book. And two years later, he writes, the book. <laughs> here's the book. Yeah, I participated in it. And um, and Ruth Pointer of the Pointer Sisters wrote the um, forward for wow. the book. Mm -hmm. that's, so mag that's magnificent. Yeah, it's really, it's really, cr and the great thing about that book <clears throat> is, it's it's it, he inter, it's really other people telling my story. So he interviewed like 150 people that have known me throughout my life wow. since I was born. And that, and they're telling what they know of the Black Diamond. And that's the, the book, really. It's other people Ooh. talking. Yeah. Now, is that book available for the audience that's watching? It is. It's. Um, I have some they can get through me, but also Amazon. I sign them if they get them through me, but it's also on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. Amazon.com. Yeah, it has Black, Black Diamond. The Black Diamond, The Real Illusion. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. That, that is magnificent. Yeah. Now, now, for the audience that's watching, you know, mm -hmm. there's people out there. I mean, I, I know personally that I've gone through hard times coming up. Uh, what would you say to someone that might be going through hard times? You mentioned that you were homeless at one point. Mm -hmm. What message would you would you relay to those people that are watching now that feel like, you know, they're at the end of their rope or it's dark, they can't see light at the tunnel in the end of the tunnel? What would you what would you tell these people? So I would say, and 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 I try to tell the, do this talk about this in my show when I'm performing on stage, uh, take a few minutes to, 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 you said something you just said, which was they can't see the light. And I, and the writer of the book asked me, what do you want people to take away from this book? After I read the main, you know, read the proofed it. And uh, I said, I had to think about it for a second. And I said, I really want them to realize that there's always a light, even if we can't, see it easily it's there and we have to just look for it because eventually you're going to find the light and it's going to bring you out you're going to move towards it out of the darkness and that's what I did in my life which was you know sometimes not the easiest
but I always tried to look for the light. Another thing I tell people is a great, great, great quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, if you, and I think this is in the book too, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Oh, and man. So, yeah. I've lived by those words ever since I heard that he had said that. And you know what? That was moving in itself. Mm -hmm. We care yeah. a lot, America. You don't bring me flowers, solitary man. This guy can sing it like nobody else can besides the great Neil. Yes. But thank you so much for being on the show. But before we go, yes. how do they reach you? What's the website? When is the next show? What's the next project you got going on? Yeah, so I'm back on the road now since uh, I did my first tour two weeks ago since pre-COVID. Like when COVID hit, everything stopped, as you know. Oh. And so I went back two weeks ago. It was the first time in three years I went on the road and I went to Nashville and Chicago and Michigan and had a great time. And I go back out tomorrow and, but they can reach me. Uh, we're building the website. And, uh, and Twitter. And so they can send me there, follow me there and, and see when the show is to your town. Hold on, we, we, we had a little technical difficulties. If you can say that again, don't worry, this will be edited. Your, your, your frame is, is froze a little bit. So let's get you back going. Hold on for one second. Let's see if you're going again. There you are. All right. Okay. Tell me that again. So you, you, you're doing your thing. Things are happening for you. How do they reach you? Tell me the website information. I know you got shows going on all over the world. Yes, I do. Um, thankfully, they love Neil Diamond everywhere. So uh, uh, now that he's retired from music, unfortunately, due to Parkinson's uh, disease, oh. he had to leave music but uh, or leave the stage. But they can find me on social media, Black Neil Diamond Tribute Singer on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and uh, find out when I'm coming to a town, to their town, to your town. And, uh, and of course, send me messages through there as well. I'm happy to uh, entertain and respond. Oh, man. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm sure you're going to be doing a lot more stuff in Vegas. I can't wait to get back to Vegas. I got to tell you, I was there a few years ago. Neil Diamond got word of it, Sly, and sent members of his own band to play behind me. So I got to work with uh, King Harrison and Ronnie Tut, who was Elvis's drummer before Neil, and oh, some man. of his band members, Tom Hensley. It was amazing. It was really, really amazing. And I'm thankful to him. I thank him for doing that because he really didn't have to do that. And so many people have stepped in to kind of help, you know, move my show to the next, the Pointer Sisters, I mean, there's just, there are no words for how much the Pointer Sisters have helped me and how influential influential they've been in my life. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. Oh, that's, that's phenomenal, yeah. man. And you know what? We, we me and you, we definitely got to collaborate. Because absolutely, mean, my juices are flowing right now. My creative, yeah. I'm like, oh, we definitely got to do something. Uh, that I like that, you know, when uh, Rhea and again, thank uh, again, another thanks to uh, Rhea for um, for setting this up uh, when she sent me the note and said, you got to reach out to him. First thing I, I saw your name and I was like, oh, yes, I love that name. I've got to interview with this guy, you know, because I just love your name. It's so cool. And a collaboration would be through the roof. Absolutely. So I'd we'll definitely. Do that. Listen, it's an honor to have you on the Mensa Margarita Show. It's my honor to be here. Thank you for having me, Sly. And thank you as well, man. God bless you, my brother. Yeah, I'll see you soon. Let's shake the world. Welcome to the Mensa Margarita Show. We got rap star, 32 years of hip hop from Pittsburgh, 
aka Hurricane Cam. Mm -hmm. yep. You're talking about a guy that has lyricism. You're talking about a guy that knows how to storytell. Mm -hmm. You name it, he can do it. How you been, my brother? Oh, uh, man, I've been great, man. Uh... Ooh, uh, a little tired. I, I literally just like woke up not too long ago, like an hour ago. Well, actually two hours ago, I went back to sleep. You know, I just, you know, I was working, working all week and everything. And then I was doing other things like, you know, uh, fixing the car and everything. So my week been like crazy. So I just slept in. It's one of these weekends where oh. I, can't, I can't wait till tomorrow so I can play the Al Green. You know, not Al Green. I could play some Al Green or something like that or some Lionel Richie. Easy, easy like Sunday morning. You know what I'm like saying? We doing some Lionel Richie, right? Come you know, on. Lionel Richie. We got to do some Lionel Richie. You know that in the morning, you know, with the <laughs> curtain, with the curtains pulled back just a little bit so the morning sun can, you know, shine on your presence a little bit. That's what it is, man. That's what it is, man. So Pittsburgh. Yeah. You know, um, we know about Wiz Khalifa, right? Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. But what, I mean, I want you to tell me how was it growing up in, in Pittsburgh? I mean, what, what was it like as a child for you? You know, it it was crazy because, you know, um, growing up in Pittsburgh, like, it's like the 90s. We talking about the 90s, right? The the early well, 90s. Uh, when I was born, I was born on uh, February 7th, 1991. Um, on a Thursday, 9 p.m., doing the Cosby show. <laughs> I think that's what it was. Yeah, I think that's what my mom told me. And, um... You know, growing up in the 90s, if anybody had who had an actual childhood in the 90s who enjoyed, you know, being a kid in the 90s, we talking about living in an area where there was a black community and there was they were prideful about like the 90s was like a reconstruction of the 70s because it was so pro black. Yes, pro black. You know, so my neighborhood I grew up in is, is called Homewood. And back then, every every summer, they would have the uh, festival Harambe. And they would have all the African people, you know, coming in, doing African dance, you know, selling African art, African work, um, African food, you know, different stuff like that. So being in that culture. Yes. And not only being in that culture, but also, you know, watching TV and having certain t uh, television shows that also promoted, you know, being pro-black, like living single. Yeah. You know, um, the African up, medallions. Watching. Remember the African medallions? <laughs> like, like this is this is the things like me having me going to Catholic school because I went to Catholic school. I went to Catholic school half years uh, of of uh, um me going to school. So I was like from I want to say pre-k kindergarten all the way to fifth grade and then fifth grade um i went to public school you know what so, the story's a lot like mine a little bit exactly like it, it's parallel so i'm in a neighborhood and the neighborhood you know was the hood so i grew up around with a lot of crips you know um east side crips and um a lot of my family are east side crips so I grew up not only growing up in an area like that, but also like you go from things like that to where you see now in like the gang, certain gang culture and everything. And knowing that when you've been around it, like, you know, some shit, but you be like, it's not, it's bad, but you have a lot of stories like mine that didn't go that route. Right. And they make it seem like it's like like if we was talking about the boys in the hood, right? The boys in the hood movie. Right. I would be I would be the Trey. Right. <laughs> right. You know, we have a lot of we have a lot of dough boys, and that's cool because we grew up with a lot of dough boys. You know, a lot of dough boys is our brothers. You know what I'm saying? We had Rickies. Some of us used to be Rickies. You know, we had Rickies, you know. But you also had a lot of trades. And being that, you know, growing up in the 90s, my mom and my father were very instrumental in me going this hip-hop route. You know, right. subliminally. My dad, I asked my dad, my dad, you know, I'm very, very, very close 
um, with my father. Um, I love that. I love hearing that. Yeah, I'm I'm very close with my father. You don't really get to hear that too much. Like it, even if you look at like the Boys in the Hood movie, my yes. dad would be furious. Like literally. Wow, he was that guy. My dad was him. You wow. know. So I I remember I have um there was there was uh, one of my um uh friends, old friends from high school. He asked me one day, um, cause sometimes we, he'll come to me for like advice or come to me asking me questions about certain things in history. And I'll tell him about it. And I remember he asked me, he said, bro, when did you become like, like this? Like, was you like, when was you, when did you come to this enlightenment? And I said, to be honest with you, man, when we was 11 years old, I was like this. I was always like this, but how would you feel as as an eleven year old, you know, uh, boy, and me being the same age, and me talking about certain things that is going to go over your head all day? You're gonna look at me like I'm a weirdo. That's right. That's right. So I was like, so that's why I said I always. I remember my my father used to buy these books, um, you were, these African books. You were advanced. Yeah, exactly, and like right. my. Like my parents, like it's crazy. So my dad, he used to buy these books and it was like these ancient African books that would teach about African um, history, uh, like Kemet, um, um, uh, Kush, all of that. We even talked yeah. about, you know, um, intergalactical shit, you know, talking about uh, uh, talking about certain things like um, different races of aliens. Right. Come on now. You know, different races of aliens and people. And I always tell people now to, to piggyback on that. My father's father, my, my grandfather used to be a minister. Okay. He had his own church. So and therefore, my dad taught me the Bible, which okay. also therefore led me to be an atheist. That's just what I'm saying. Wow. So uh, my dad, me and my dad, we teeter totter on that uh subject because he he's not an atheist but he knows that the, the 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 things in the bible that we that is there isn't right at all he believes there's some truth to it me i just think it's propaganda but that's another story but him being a preacher's kid you gotta understand like i didn't had debates with people and i'm like what better person wouldn't know the bible than a preacher's son just because right. you go to church every Sunday and you might read little scriptures don't mean that you actually know the Bible. You growing up with a kid who had to live the Bible his whole life because right. his dad so you, was. And you dealt with it your life. And, and, and you're entitled to formulate your right. opinion. Right. right. Yeah. And, that's, and, that's, and that's the crazy part. So my dad used to buy these books from like Malachi Yamba out or Malachi York or something like that. Uh, there was these black books. It was Malachi York, and he would come up with all of these things. Like there was like um, a book that was my favorite. Uh, I mean, that my was my dad's favorite. It was called The Body Parts of uh, God, and it would talk about the metaphysics and and different other stuff that people is not really hip to. So imagine being eleven years old, and I'm gravitating towards that. Not only that, but imagine in the summertime around 1996 and you riding in your dad's um cadillac with the leather seats that's burning your skin when the sun hits it you, got the, you got the i you remember the, the birds the i remember the birds you got the belt you got the you know the seat belt and then you got the wood grain and everything like that imagine oh. your dad blowing the ac go right through the hood and all you hear going through the in the speakers is East East ninety nine 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 East East ninety nine 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 nine. You get okay. that, you know, and then you flip it around and you get um, uh, you'll get something like um, uh, uh some LL Cool J, you know, I'm bad, oh, you, you know, know I get that. Oh. You know, you'll get that. Then you also turn around and get Nas is like life or death. You know, you'll get something like that, you know, and then you'll get, um, uh, uh, walk with me, Hail Mary, run with C's. So yeah. my dad is playing classic hip hop right that when I was a kid straight off the gate. Not yeah. only that he's playing, not only that he's playing that, 
but he's playing some R&B. Now, that's my father's side. Now, my mother's side, she don't know that she kind of subliminally led me to this way. I never had right. this conversation with her. Um, but she she used to um, work at two radio stations here she in Pittsburgh. WAMO. Yep. My mom used to work for WAMO. Right. Over a decade. Come on now. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> so my mom, <laughs> you know, she worked for it. Yeah, she worked for two radio stations. And actually, the one radio station that she worked um, mostly was literally the next block over from like my Catholic school. So if wow. I got in trouble, all she had to do is come out that window. <laughs> <laughs> Just come out the window and yell. Like that was how close it was. So um, my mom worked for a radio station called WCXJ. And there were some people that, you know, knew me since I was like a little kid, like a baby, baby growing up. Like my mom also actually, I think, worked for WQED. If anybody don't know who WQED is, that is a Pittsburgh radio station that gave you Mr. Rogers. Wow. My mom told me that. Uh, Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Yeah, Mr. Rogers, his whole, the whole place, that's Pittsburgh. Wow, I never knew that. The trolleys, we, we don't have the trolleys no more, but if you go to certain places in Pittsburgh, like the South Side, you can actually see um, the trolley tracks, you know, um, in the wow. street. I think they have, like, there is, like, maybe one or two trolleys, but it's in a certain place in Pittsburgh. But Pittsburgh, everywhere we used to have that. So my mom actually told me that Mr. Rogers held me as a baby. Wow. Yeah. So... My mom was there. My mom, she graduated from Duquesne University. She um, in communications. So there was people in Pittsburgh that would know her. She's very like in that circle. She's prominent. Like people know her. from Right. Yeah. So I mean, there's times because I look like my mom. And so there's certain places where I go and I mean, they be like, oh, you, you, what's her name's kid? <laughs> I can't even deny it. I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, that's 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 my mom. So, um, Dukes, that's my Dukes. Yeah, so it's like that's what it is. So my mom, she worked for um, Whammo on the news side. So she, there was like the news side that was shared and broadcasting network. This is um, where you have your April Ryan. My mom used to actually, you know, you know April Ryan. You ever heard of April Ryan? No, never heard of her. She she was um, one of those women. <clears throat> she's one of those women that goes and um does like news reports for like the white house she does oh. news reports and like things like that and when she would do her drops and her radio my mom would be on the other side you know editing it and everything like wow. that and my mom had like a switchboards actually me and my mom actually did a commercial uh when i was like four years old a radio commercial and it was a radio station. I mean, it was a, um, for a, a shoe store that's actually still in business. Is it still in business? I think. I'm not sure. But it was like a shoe store. So the radio drop, it had me at like four years old saying, I need shoes, mom. Mom, <laughs> I need shoes. I need shoes, mom. And she's like, kids, you know, they always got to have that or that. That's why I go to this store. To get a, a, <laughs> and it was like that. So subliminally, she don't know that she kind of led me on that way. And then being that she worked at a radio station, I was soaking up game. That's and right. And then I'm with the DJs. Shout out to DJ Black Steel. Um, DJ, uh, uh, Steel. DJ, DJ Black Steel from Pittsburgh. Um, he's actually one of the people I used to hang around early back in the day you know so when my mom would bring me to work on a saturday from like 6 a.m to like maybe 2 p.m and i would wake up around like maybe noon or something like that and i would go off on the radio side to kick it with them while they in the dj booth spinning records for the people taking in calls and just that and the third so i'm soaking all of that in at that wow. time i met um i met the who, who you know the light skinned dude from um that show one on one that was on Beats? He was chiropractic. His name was Arnez. Oh yeah, I know you're talking about. I forgot the he name. Played in Coach Carter. I forgot his name. Yeah, I think I it was like Richard I Richard I something. I met him there. 
I met him there. That's because my radio station was interviewing him from the launch of um, Coach Carter. So being that I was in the media like that, I was already having an ear. And then my mom, she actually had a, uh, she married a man um, way later. My my parents broke up when I was three, but my mom remarried when I was like seven, eight. And the guy that she remarried, he also worked at a radio station. And it was an all-talk radio station <laughs> in Pittsburgh the, uh, called WKQV, my stepfather, you know. So I was always he was a technical he was a technical guy on top of a military guy. Like he used to be in the military, then he worked in the steel mills. If anybody don't know, Pittsburgh was the number one in steel at one point in production around the, the whole Pittsburgh world. Steelers, come on. Uh nah. Uh, nah. <laughs> and I say that, and I say that from Pittsburgh, and, I, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit why. Because the reason why is because I don't, I don't mess with the NFL no more. I boycotted the NFL ever since the Colin Kaepernick's came, and you know he was kneeling doing a peaceful protest for yeah. one of the biggest issues in America, and everybody wanted to shut him up. Meanwhile, yeah. people can storm the yeah. Capitol. You mean to tell me it's okay for people to storm the Capitol? It's but crazy. it's not okay come for on, a person man. to kneel. Like, come on, man. It's like, so ever since then, I haven't watched a football game since. I don't wow. care about it no more because they don't care about us. And some of us go into and still indulge in that, and 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 that's fine if that's if that's fine. But if an organization have blatantly showed disrespect, just like Gucci has blatantly showed disrespect, having a shirt that got a black face on it, and I go to the gas station and see this um, um, dude wearing skinny jeans with a Gucci visor and everything like that, <laughs> and I'm like, you know they don't like you, bruh. And he's like, yeah, man, I know, but you know it's Gucci, man. It, it's Gucci. It's Gucci. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yo, this is the mindset. We still enslave yeah. sometimes. I mean, sometimes we we still enslave. Gucci rap star. Now listen, you seem so passionate mm. about all these different things. Are all these different things conveyed in your music? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> like, like it's like, don't you love when you can actually see a rapper and he's exactly who he is? Exact the mundo. Yes. So the same topics that I have that I touch in, in my music, it's the same topics that I touch in, in basic everyday life that I have with people, you know? So I feel like hip hop is an autobiography. You know, I'm an MC. So I feel like hip hop is an autobiography. So that means these words that I'm spitting to you is coming directly from the experiences that I am going through and still right. going through till this day. And, um, you know, it's just, my whole thing is being that I graduated from college and, and got a bachelor's in history, specializing in African-American, Latino, and Native American history. I feel like... Congrats on that. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Since... I'm not able to physically go to school to further because that's what I want to do because my mom did it. She got a master's degree, a um, couple of master's degrees, actually, BMA, BM, she, she's decorated. But um, being that I'm not able at this moment to continue on that. I can still study and I can still research because the same information right. that I would go and get in college would be the same information I can go and research on my own. The only difference is I'm doing it on my own time and not on somebody else's time. That's and it. I'm not, and I'm not, you know, paying for it. So if I can do that, what better way in hip hop to enlighten my people through my music? Educate. Absolutely. So me being that, me being that I come from that, I want people to, when they listen to my music, I want something like a college lesson, a college course, rather than going two years for an associate's, four years for a bachelor, and if you continue on to go on to grad school, 
and everything, the same type of information that you would get, I want you to get from my music. That's and a good way to put it. I like that. That's that's exactly what it is. So, and I'm hip hop. You know, I'm not. I'm I'm hip hop. Like I know you're hip hop. <laughs> like me personally, like I'm gonna tell you, me personally, I think the blueprint for a rapper who was born in the 1990s, early 1990s, their mindset should be like this. Their mind, their mind, our mindset is young enough to still know what's going on, but old enough to see the bullshit. Right. There we go. You know what I'm saying? So that's and, so true. And we still learning. And we that's still true. learning. You know, I told people, I was like, you know, all this social media, all this social like social media stuff started with like we was the first generations to deal with all that. That's right. I was just telling I was just telling my wife, I was like, my generation was the first like generation to actually have functioning computers that did multiple stuff like go on the internet play oregon trail uh play carmen san diego oh, hello my gosh this is a 90s baby i'm talking to i haven't heard that in a long time oregon trail the sun <laughs> <laughs> and i was always mad because i didn't want to be no pilgrim <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up. And you know what? Your song 1990-ish. I love that track. That's a that's a really great track. And we're gonna oh, we're gonna man. be play, we're playing it on the show for the audience to hear that. How did you mm -hmm. come up with that song? Well, I have a concept right now. Um I'm working on my my first EP. All the music that I have been doing, um pre-2000, uh, 2020, okay. were songs that were like mixtape songs. All I got all, I got a lot of songs, but they're all on my SoundCloud. But if you, and you can go, because there's songs that I have from 2014 all the way till now. And you can see the progression that I go through. Like, right. I will tell you, I will tell you just a little bit of songs that I did. Like, I did a remix to... Uh, Queen Latifah's Unity, and I named oh, it God. Black Awareness. You I and I, Black you Awareness. I come on. And not only that, not only that, I was doing this, and I put these records together. I was recording these records and and mixing these records on Audacity back then. It's it's not a good quality to have in a studio, but you still hear it. So what I did was I was putting animation in because if anybody knows me, that I'd be telling you the reason why. I rap the way that I rap like now because I was influenced by 50 Cent, Eminem, and the G Unit, and the whole G Unit mixtape movement, the G Unit radios, yeah. helped kind of shape who I am today. Listening to all that, so when I would turn on to a 50 Cent G Unit mixtape, and I would hear Who Kid, and I would hear certain skits in the mixtapes that was funny, but you know did certain things. So right. in the Unity song. I created a skit to where it was my first, it was actually my first interpretation or no, I'm sorry. It was my first encounter with a policeman being brutalized. Well, not brutalized, but kind brutalized. of like, you know, not brutalized because they ain't touched me, but being like um, a suspect. And I really, and I really, because I fit the description. Because right. at that time in my high school, we had like gang fights. People was beating up the uh, teachers and principals and everything. And they brought police up to the school. And I'm walking up because I'm going to my grandmother's after school. I either went to the gym, the box, go to the library, or um, went to the CD store to buy mixtapes and instrumentals. And the cops pulled me over thinking that they didn't even know that I went to the school that they was protecting. Yeah. Yeah. A little that racial. Was all, that was all in a skit. So. <laughs> to get back to night to get back to 1990-ish, it was just like my first introduction to well, it was my second introduction to the actual world of my music because power to my people, I released that on my birthday of last year, February 7th. And then my second record was 1990-ish. So when I wrote 1990-ish, I wanted to give that whole 90s feel 
I that mean, vibe. a real 90s feel, not that 90s feel where people just do remixes to 90s songs. I mean, we talking about somebody who's still in a space where uh, last night I was watching Friends. <laughs> the night before I was watching Full House. The night before I was watching Frasier. Full House, come on, I love it. The 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 week after that I was watching um uh even though it's two thousands I was watching uh girlfriends I was watching all of us you know I was watching half and half you know all of these shows that I grew up watching you know so I'm in that space I'm in that zone I'm not just remixing a '90s song like no yeah. son I should be in the category of like a '90s rapper who is still like current. But like yeah. not current, but like an updated '90s version rapper. So that 1990-ish, I heard, I got it from New York Bangers. Shout out to New York Bangers. When I first heard that song, I fell in love with it. I can tell. You, I mean, I you see, out the, jump out of the, out of the camera right now. <laughs> you know what? I, there's certain things that I do, like actually, like the hook that I got from it when I say it's <laughs> rap to the star. Rocking the blue Kango, Puerto Rican pendant on the chain, watching Dango. That was actually part of a verse that I had written before that. And I was rapping the verse to that beat. And once it got to that, it's rap to the store, rocking the blue Kango, Puerto Rican pendant on the chain, watching Dango. It was like, okay, I'm going to use this for the hook. So this is how dedicated I am. The Puerto wow. Rican pendant on the chain. Watch it dangle. This guy is committed, guys. Look at this. 90s baby. He's got the pendants. He is, he is committed. So oh, you know what? I'm, and, and listen, not to cut you off, but I love the name Rap Star. My father gave me that. I mean, it, it, it's brilliant. My father gave me that. Shout out to my father, man. He gave, me that. he gave me that name. Like, I asked him questions. Like, I asked him questions. Like, I'd be like, do you know you kind of put me in this lane? And he was like, yeah, I knew. And so I had other rap names. Like, when I was a kid, I had problems <laughs> uh, coming up with a great rap name. You know, I had my first rap name was Little Desperado. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <good enough> for pops. <laughs> the other one the other one was kck i don't know why maybe because i like kc I and the sunshine band or something like that i yeah. don't know so you go through the motion you go through the we all go yeah. through my dad was like you know what nah i'm gonna name you rap star r-a-p-s-t-a-r-r -R -R. that's because you are with other rappers are trying to be what other MCs are you already are what they are trying to be so well, that's rap, how rap star, you know what your bars ain't never been ordinary my brother <laughs> <laughs> man oh sh that song right there shout out the beat the guy who made the beat shout out to uh Beat tell us about that song Benbo bars ain't never been ordinary ordinary Shout out to um Beat Assassins Inc. The guy who made the beat is from Canada. Shout out to Canada. Shout out to Canada. Man, when I heard that beat, that was another song because you know, once I started hearing the beat, like I have co emotional connections with you know instrumentals. So if I, if I feel passionate about it, I can write a whole song under thirty minutes if I'm passionate about it from the right. beat that I feel get it, it from the vibe. You feel it, yeah, right. So that so that beat just was like, oh, it's this is gonna be crazy. I said, I gotta spit, I like I gotta go super saiyan with this. Another another 90s, you know, quote, super saiyan. I was like, I gotta go super saiyan with this. <laughs> so when I got it, I was like, okay, what I try to do is I try to lyrically beat myself from what I did before. So if I lyrically killed it last time, I have to top that. I'm my own competition. That's right. So this is where the Hurricane Cam comes in. That's my old, another alter ego that I have. That's Hurricane Cam. And Hurricane Cam, I got that from, if anybody remember back in 2005 when um, 50 Cent let the game go from G-Unit. 
Right. And the game to combat that energy, to have that, to match that energy, he created um, an alter ego named Hurricane Game. And that's kind of like my hurry. It's like Eminem to Slim Shady. You know, that's right. my Eminem. That's my Slim Shady to my Eminem. That is my Hurricane Game to the game. You know, that is uh, my Machiavelli to my Tupac. You right. know, so that's like, that was Hurricane Cam spitting band bow. Rap Store was spit in 1990-ish. 1990-ish. You know what I'm saying? Well, listen, whether it's Rap Star or Hurricane Cam, I love everything that you're doing. Now, how, how, how does the audience get in contact with Hurricane Cam, a.k.a. Rap Star, Rap Star, a.k.a. Hurricane Cam? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, they can they can holler at me. They can go on my uh face my Facebook fan page, um R A P S T A R R A K A Hurricane Cam. Um, now I have two. There's two accounts of me, but I can only get into the one. The one that I can get to, um, it's the A K A without the dots. So if you use AKA and put in the dots in between, you'll get my uh, page. They got me with the Puerto Rican flag behind me. And then there's another one. And I forgot what um, I think is my latest ma magazine cover. I've been on seven magazine covers, by the way. Um, but I think wow. that's it. Yeah. So if you go to that one, it's whatever who got the lowest number. I got like a thousand uh that's the one that i use now it's like over a thousand and the one that i have that i can't get into is like 1800 so the one that's the lowest use that one but uh also hit my twitter rap star um r-a-p-s-t-a-r-r-412 -R -R um you get me i i spell this out because you don't know how many times people misspell my name right <laughs> People misspell my name. It's they be like R A P S T A R R A P P S T A R R. So that's why <laughs> I have to spell it so people can get it. You All know, right, guys, guys, take notes now. Make sure you get a pen and paper. Write it down. Please do. Please do. Um, you can hit my Instagram. It's Rap to the Star. It's uh, I T S R A P number two. T H E S T A R R. It's the same thing um, as my TikTok. My TikTok, on the other hand, has a different side of rap store. It shows like the hip hop model. Um, what I do is, if you see the shirt that I got on right now, I got you know a shirt of TLC. That's dope. I love right that shirt. here. Thank you, thank you. And I have, I have like a lot of these clothes that I rock, and I throw their music videos behind it, including my own, because I got my own shirts that got my face on it, and I'll put my music behind it. But I have like, um, uh, shout out to Headgear Classics, uh, um, um, clothing line. They come out with like some of the dopest clothes ever. Like I got like, um, a jacket that got. Aaliyah on the back, and it got DMX on the front for the um, wow. Romeo Must Die. Ed Gear Classics. I'm going, man. I'm writing it down myself. I also got a, a, a Boys in the Hood hat. Uh, what else I got? I got a um, a Martin jacket. What? I got... Uh, I be rocking some stuff. I be rocking the furs, like... So, like, my... Like, the people who know me knows that little kim is also another one of my like influences in the game lyrically and in fashion so you'll see a lot of shout things little that you shout out to little kim so you'll um see a lot of that fashion kind of industry thing going on with that you know so that's you know. fly that's, fly. that's good and, it, and, it, and, I, and i love the, the fact that you give credit you know to the people that inspire you Oh you know? yeah, like it's 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 dope. Like so, Fifty Cent is one of my is like my number two favorite, right? His favorite rapper growing up was KRS One, and I met KRS One at my college. Wow! The so imagine you imagine you listening to your favorite rapper's favorite rapper, meeting your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's the crazy thing. I met DMX two years before he died. Wow. That's, That's another one of my influences. Oh, oh goodness. I love DMX. Great soul. 
Yo, let, let me tell you a little story about X, but really it was crazy when I when I met him that night. Shout out to my man True Live. He's another dope MC from Pittsburgh. Oh my God. True if Live. You think, if you think I was nice, that that man's ill, man. That man, he I it's crazy. Between me, him, and, and the song Bambo, I say ain't nobody better than me, live in true Bra uh, tr uh, Sonny Brasco. These are the people that I'm talking about. So when I say live, I'm talking about him. Sonny Brasco, shout out to Sonny Brasco too, another dope MC. So those are the people that I'm talking about. But he's connected with Ja Rule and Murder Inc. Wow. And he has connections. So one time I'm at work and he calls me he goes and let me tell you, my 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 man, True Live. You know, we we have an interesting history, being that you know how he's connected with Murder Inc. and how I grew up. You know, right. on Fifty Side. <laughs> so, but he hit me up and he was like, "Yo, I need you to slide through the hood real quick." Now, the same neighborhood that I'm talking about that I grew up in that had Harambe, he was there in that neighborhood in a club. So wow. imagine going to that club. And about uh, two blocks away is that same Catholic school that you used to go to when you was like four or five years old. Wow. So that night I went home, changed, came back. I'm waiting outside. There's about 30 Rough Rider guys in the motorcycles going up and down the street with the quads. And the, I'm like, yo, this shit is crazy. Then I look out and I see a, a black suburban. I'm waiting for my man True Live to come to the club. He's rolling with X and everything. So all of a sudden, four guys come out with like Rough Rider jackets and a black suburban. X follows out. Wow. There was a blue and white bike in between us. And I extended my hand. I said, Yo, X, big fan, huge fan. And he looks at me and he looks at me, he looks at the bike and he said, Hey, yo, is that your bike? And I was like, nah, <laughs> man, that ain't my bike, man. He's like, I'm just saying because you wear blue and white, the bikes wear blue and white. I just thought that was your bike, yo. I was like, nah, man. I was like, yo, that's X right there. I go back into the club. I'm in the VIP section. X is literally sitting right behind me. I turn around, and he goes, yeah. I say, yo, X, is it possible if I can get a pitch? And he's like, you the man from outside, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, he's like, yeah, yeah, come on, man. See, that's beautiful. Me growing up in the 90s and seeing these as our heroes that we grew up. Right. For everybody who either had a father in their life or didn't, these were our heroes growing up. That's true. So every time I talk about this, like, you know, talk about me meeting DMX, I always shout out to my homie for giving me that opportunity to even tell this story. It's emotional, you know? It is. And it was emotional. It was more emotional for him being that he was, he spent more time with DMX than I did. Yeah. And for him to be gone like that, I had to check up on him to make sure he was okay. He was okay. He was going through a lot, not only X dying, but a couple other things happening. So I had to check on him, you know? Yeah. So I love this unity that we have for one, like one another as MCs, because I'm growing up and seeing some of my favorite rappers hang out with each other. Yeah. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Right. So imagine, beautiful. imagine imagine the next generation of rappers who's watching me and being that I'm their favorite, but they also like somebody else and they see me and them kicking it and they'd be like, oh snap. How do you think my how do you think my second favorite rapper uh uh became 50 Cent? Eminem's my first. I was already an Eminem fan. Boom. 50 gets signed to Shady. That's crazy. 50 gets signed, uh, 50 gets signed and drops G unit. Divine intervention, man. It's amazing, my brother. But let me tell you something. There's gonna be a whole bunch of people that are gonna be fans of you. You got a great spirit. You're very passionate about everything that you you represent. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Mental Margarita Show. I appreciate you for having me, man. Sorry for the technical difficulties, man. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Life is technical. So <laughs> you right, man. You right. Shout out to Beverly. 
Shout out to Beverly Bush, Beautiful Danger Entertainment. Shout out to CJ. Uh, man, we doing big things, man. We doing big things, man. We're going to see you in Vegas real soon, man. You have a good one, my brother. You do the same. Let's shake the world. East Coast. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah, it's Rap Star, Eastside, Pittsburgh, established February 7th, 1991, it's such a beautiful danger, <laughs> yeah.
you starstruck, here's a sprinkle of the stardust. Hold your champagne glass and your cigars up. See the guys with mob ties drive the cars up. Bright lights, most nights they buy the bars up. Candy coated Chevy cars on the highway. It's Frankie Baby, it's on, and this is my way. Dean Martin at the Sands this Friday. With Sammy Davis, here's a little hint where I stay. The city shines like Liberace's mansion. And you know Elvis had the whole city dancing. Showgirl silhouette, steady prancing. Shout out to June, just the Copa Girls anthem. Legal gambling, yeah, that would tempt me. It's Sin City, holy water couldn't cleanse me. And Wayne Newton had the crowd in a frenzy. Live at the Stardust, the seats never empty. I'm in Las Vegas, and a count of three, I want to hear you scream, Viva Las Vegas. Ready? One, two, three. Viva Las Vegas! And Main Street was the official local beer stop. Enough slot machine noise to make your ears pop. The cigarette girls walk in souvenir shops. My Red Fox had them laughing till the tears drop. Before Steve got a win at the right time, Sig and Roy had a long circus lifeline. Now the strips got a lot of neon light signs. Would you agree there's not another city like mine? Later, Mayweather got the city hot, and everybody in your city with a TV watch. Celine Dion got celebrities at every spot. Voice the man, even.